What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we're here to talk about one of my very favorite bands of all time, Blink-182. The band that defines pop punk more than any other band, and takes me back to the good old days of farting on my friends, watching CKY, and crushing on the girl who worked at the popcorn stand at the mall. But how did all this happen? How did they go from being just a couple nerds in a San Diego high school band to becoming one of the most influential rock bands of all time, right up there with Green Day and Linkin Park, with nearly 30 years of history behind them? I will explain in this video. But first, if you haven't, check me out on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific. There's a link to that in the description of this video. But first, I want to thank Kern Club for sponsoring this video. As some of you may know, I was a graphic designer for about 10 years, and if there is one thing that I love in this world, it is fonts. And Kern Club makes all these like really cool vintage inspired fonts that I wish I had back in the day, but with all the love and attention to detail that you expect from a modern font. For example, Kernable Corpse, which may or may not have been inspired by the Sepultura logo. I also like Sword Lord, which comes in three variations and takes you right back to 1983 in the back of some like smoky, dodgy arcade. Thrash Blade is another one along the same lines, which might be even cooler. There's also Old Edgar, which is one of the absolute hardest Old English fonts ever made. Like, I am intimidated just looking at this font. And that is just the start. They've got dozens and dozens more. All of them are just as awesome as the ones that I mentioned. So if you want to head over to Kern Club and stock up on the freshest fonts known to man, just hit the link in the description of this video and tell them that I sent you. Blink started out way back in 1992 in San Diego, California. Mark met Tom via Mark's sister. They instantly bonded over their love of bands like The Descendants and Screeching Weasel. They got their first drummer, Scott Rayner, and there you go, Blink was born. It was love at first sight, absolutely. They just are made for each other. But the band certainly got off to humble beginnings. They played their very first show at a biker bar in San Diego for an audience of literally one person. The first Blink show ever, we played at this biker bar in South San Diego. And it was literally the bartender, one patron, the three of us. We played one song and the guy said, can you please turn it down? And they got right to work. They put out their first demo called Fly Swatter in 1993, which honestly is terrible. Like it is just not good. But still you can hear the seeds of that blank sound even then. And from the very beginning, they also had that blank sense of humor. For example, the uh, very un-PC name of their fake record label written on the cassette. But their first real release was Buddha in 1994, which was released on a label called Filter Records that really honestly wasn't even a real label. It was just Mark's boss at the record store that he worked at saved up some money and agreed to put Buddha out on cassette. And I know there's blank hipsters out there who love Buddha and insist that it's the best thing they've ever done, but I am not one of those people. The truth is that it's not great. But that's not a dig on the band. In fact, that is actually what impresses me because there's some bands where they're clearly just super talented and they're just like good right out of the gate. But that is not the case with Blink. They actually kind of sucked for the first several years of the band and they became great because they put in the work. Just grinding away, getting better at songwriting, playing crappy local shows anywhere that they could, dropping off copies of their demos at local record stores, and slowly but surely building a fan base one show at a time throughout Southern California. And all that work paid off in 1995 when they signed to Cargo Records and put out Cheshire Cat, which is when they first really started to sound like the blink we know today. We'll stereo and, we'll drive to Madagascar because... and that is also when they became Blink 182 rather than just Blink, because it turned out there's some other band called Blink from Scotland who apparently owned the name and threatened to sue them. So they added the 182 at the end because, you know, there's all those number bands back then like Link 80 and MU330 and stuff. It was the 90s, that's just what you did. And around the same time, they also got on their first real tour, which was for the surf film Good Times, along with Pennywise, Unwritten Law, and Seven Seconds, including their very first international 
shows in Australia. And considering that they had put out their first demo only two years earlier, this was pretty amazing progress for them. Like going from an honestly pretty crappy local band to touring with Pennywise that fast is pretty amazing. All of which led up to them getting the attention of major labels, eventually signing to MCA, and putting out their first really real album, Dude Ranch, in 1997, which was when I discovered the band. I heard them on some sampler CD for the Snowcore tour around then. I think Josie was the song. I liked it, so I bought the album and instantly fell in love with the band. Because to me, they were just like the updated version of The Descendants, who are another one of my favorite bands of all time. It was the soundtrack to being a suburban kid whose whole life revolved around going to shows, unsuccessfully pursuing girls, making dick jokes, and doing dumb shit with your friends. But all in this very relatable PG-13 kind of way that could appeal to everybody like me to like a sixth grader. The video for Josie is kind of like the perfect example of this, which by the way, I also think is the best song from this era of the band. It's essentially like their version of one of the teen movies at the time, like Can't Hardly Wait. It takes place at a high school. They even got Alyssa Milano, who like everybody my age had a massive crush on when we were kids. Just perfect. And my girlfriend likes you well and DHC. And she's so but their first real breakthrough song was Damn It which first got radio play in Southern California, then national radio, and eventually MTV picked up the video, put it into heavy rotation, and by 1998, Dude Ranch had gone gold. And that came as a surprise even to the band. Tom said, when Damn It took off, we were freaking. We couldn't believe this was happening to us. But as much success as they had with Dude Ranch, with their next album, Enema of the State, that is when things really, really changed for Blink. First of all, they fired their drummer, Scott Rayner, when his drinking got out of control and replaced him with Travis Barker, who was playing in Aquabats at the time. And with all due respect to Scott, I know there's people who think he was their best drummer, but honestly, getting Travis was just a massive upgrade for the band. I mean, honestly, Scott is kind of like an okay punk drummer at best, whereas with Travis, he is one of the all-time greats of rock drumming, period. They also got Jerry Finn on board as a producer who had previously done Dookie for Green Day. And with that new team, they made, in my opinion, a masterpiece. Like, Dude Ranch was good, but Enema of the State was great. Like, 10 out of 10. In my opinion, maybe the perfect pop punk album. And Enema of the State was basically a hit from day one. The first single off the album, What's My Age Again, was their first to cross over into mainstream radio, eventually hitting number 58 on the Billboard Hot 100. And of course, we have to talk about the video, one of the best of all time. Nobody likes you when you're 20. It's actually like a stupidly simple concept, but it's just perfect for the song and the band. Remember, this was like the peak of raunchy teen comedies like American Pie, and this video just fit perfectly in with that vibe. It ended up as the second most played video on MTV that summer, and to this day, bands still reference it. It's like a permanent part of pop culture, but their next single, All the Small Things, is what really, really turned them into household names. All the small things. And it's interesting when you hear them talk about it, it wasn't an accident that this song was such a big hit. Tom said, I remember thinking the label's gonna want a song for the radio, so here's one. And he was not wrong. It went to number six on Billboard. And again, the video was a huge part of that success. It parodied a bunch of the big pop songs and videos at the time from like Britney Spears, 98 Degrees, Christina Aguilera. And ironically, it actually ended up being a fixture on TRL, which is funny because those were the same artists that they were parodying. They were making fun of NSYNC, but at the same time, they kind of ended up being the punk version of NSYNC. And lastly, off this album was Adam's Song, which was kind of a big change of pace. It was much more dark and serious, tackling the topic of teen suicide and depression. Never thought I'd die alone. Another six months I'll be unknown. And it wasn't as big of a hit, which, you know, makes sense. Those were these big feel-good singles. This is a much darker song. But even so, I think it was just as important for their success because it showed everyone that they weren't just this goofy, jokey band that made songs about farting and whatnot, that behind all those dick jokes and stuff, they were actually thoughtful guys who really understood what their audience was going through. The album quickly went platinum and has gone on to sell over 15 million copies since then. 
I actually didn't realize it had sold that many until I wrote this video. Very, very impressive for any artist in any genre, let alone a pop punk band. But still, the band did not stop working. They put out a limited edition live album called The Mark, Tom, and Travis Show. But their next real release was Take Off Your Pants and Jacket in 2001. And by the way, it's still funny to me how many people don't realize that the album is like a joke about take off your pants and jacket. Get it? It's been 20 years. There's still people that don't get the joke, but there you go. And at the time, I remember thinking that this album just kind of felt a little bit off to me. Not bad by any means. It was just like, hmm, this isn't really the album that I was expecting from Blink after Enema of the State. And now knowing what was happening behind the scenes, it makes sense to me why I felt that way. Because basically they wanted to be three different bands. Mark talks about this in the liner notes for the deluxe edition of this album. I loved everything about Enema of the State, the music, the videos, the live show, everything. I wanted to do it again, making it bigger, better, and louder. Tom wanted something heavier, more guitar driven, dirtier. He was listening to a lot of post hardcore bands and their influence showed in what he wrote. Travis, never simply a punk rock drummer, wanted to challenge himself as well as the band. And if you're familiar with the album, all of that will explain a lot of the direction with the songs, right? And the only two songs on the album that to me really sound like classic Blink, which are Rock Show and First Date, were basically written as a fuck you to their manager who said that he didn't hear a single on the album. Again, here's Mark talking about it. We told him, you want a fucking single? I'll write you the cheesiest, catchiest, throwaway fucking summertime single you've ever heard. And so they did it. Him and Tom sat down and wrote those two songs in like a few minutes minutes each and boom in my opinion two of their very best songs especially rock show and despite all that that was going on the album was a hit it was the first punk album to debut at number one on billboard and went double platinum in less than a year and this is when the band started to kind of tear apart a bit because of all that internal tension. Tom did his side project Boxcar Racer, which was sort of like his version of Quicksand or Fugazi, and got Travis to play drums on the album because, I mean, come on. If you know Travis Barker, why would you not have him play on like every single album you can? Nobody is going to play better than Travis, right? And personally, I think the Boxcar Racer album is very, very underrated. I still listen to it pretty often. Like, very, very good post-hardcore album. Because I feel so mad. Travis also did Transplants with Tim Armstrong, which I also thought was a really cool project. So maybe those side projects sort of helped them put aside some of the tension that they were feeling and the animosity towards each other because they were able to put all that to the side and come back with their self-titled album in 2003. Which I remember really not liking at the time. I was like, huh? What is this? Like, this doesn't sound like Blank. This sounds like Boxcar Racer, but with Mark singing sometimes. Which, in hindsight, isn't wrong. It kind of does sound like that. But listening to it now, it is maybe better than I gave it credit for at the time. It's definitely more dark and moody overall, sometimes like even a little bit progressive. For example, the song Stockholm, which is pretty much like a post-hardcore song. And there's also none of the dick jokes and stuff like that that was such a big part of the band before. And so overall, I would say it's definitely a good album, but to me, it doesn't really feel like Blink. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's almost like a conscious rejection of so much of what they were before. And I was not alone. I remember a lot of people saying that at the time, like what happened to the fun, happy Blink that I knew before? But all of that being said, these days, it seems to be one of the fan favorites and it was also a commercial success, debuting at number three on Billboard. But in spite of all of that, things were really, really falling apart behind the scenes. For one, there were creative differences, especially with Tom wanting to take things in a different direction, and just like general lifestyle stuff, like with touring constantly taking a big toll on their families. And in February of 2005, Tom officially quit Blink and the band went on indefinite hiatus, which I think most people took as we're breaking up because 90% of the time when a band says we're going on hiatus, that's what it means. And then Tom quit quickly announced his new project, Angels and Airwaves, which he kind of pompously called the greatest rock and roll revolution for this generation, which was probably a sign of him just kind of generally starting to lose touch with reality and getting further into all the UFO stuff. But I thought this album was pretty fucking good. And I would say to this day, it holds up.
Mark and Travis did another project called Plus 44, which I didn't really like as much. It's certainly not bad, but it's just kind of okay to me. I'll be there when your heart stops beating. I'll be there when your last breath's taken away. And listening to it now, it actually feels like the new version of Blink without Tom, which actually kind of makes sense, right? And Travis, as always, stayed super busy. He did a bunch of other projects, including more stuff with Transplants and a bunch of hip hop with artists like Paul Wall, Bun B, and Busta Rhymes, as well as a reality show called Meet the Barkers, which nobody seems to remember, but I watched every episode because you know me, you know how much I love my shitty 2000s MTV reality shows. Meet Travis. He's the ultimate musician. He's a wonderful father. Did you have good baby dreams, huh? And a hopeless romantic. Beautiful. And it seemed like everyone in the band had pretty much moved on from Blink, but that was about to change. In 2008, Travis Barker was in a plane crash which killed four passengers on the plane with him. If you read his book, he talks about it quite a bit, and it was fucked up. He was on the plane one minute, and then the next minute, he wakes up on the ground with his skin on fire, like, falling off of him. Obviously, incredibly traumatic, but as tragic as it was, it actually brought them all back together, as Tom talks about. If that accident hadn't happened, we wouldn't be a band. Plain and simple, that was fate. And so with the band now back together, they took a few years, let Travis heal, wrote some new songs, and they came back in 2011 with Neighborhoods, which was their first album since Enema of the State without Jerry Finn. Jerry tragically died in 2008 of a brain condition. And to be honest, I really disliked this album when it came out. I was like, this just sounds like Angels and Airwaves, but not as good. It's very dark and moody, and listening to it now, I think it's not so much that it's a bad album. It's really just not what I wanted from Blink, and looking at fan opinions now, it seems like most people agree with me. And although the band stayed busy, they went out with My Chemical Romance, they did a 20th anniversary tour, but things were still bad behind the scenes, in particular with this rift between Tom and the other two guys reopening. Talking about it later, here's what Mark had to say. Everything was just always very difficult. Everything was always very contentious. There was always just a strange vibe. And so in 2014, Tom quit the band again. But this time they didn't break up. Personally, I think maybe they should have, but they decided to continue on as a band and replace Tom with Matt Skiba of Alkaline Trio. And they've done two albums with this lineup. First, California in 2016, and then Nine in 2019. And as much as I love Blink, personally, I just honestly can't get into either of these albums at all. They might be fine if they were another band, but to me, without Tom, it's honestly just not Blink. And, you know, I don't think I'll ever be able to see things a different way. But that is just me. And the way they talk about it, they seem to love what they're doing these days. And honestly, that is the most important thing. And so the last question is, what is their lasting impact and legacy? Well, I would put them up there with Korn, Linkin Park, and Green Day, as far as the most important influential rock bands of the late 90s through the 2000s. More than anyone else, plain and simple, they are the template for what pop punk sounds like, influencing thousands and thousands of bands all over the world. And beyond that, Travis has basically masterminded the entire pop punk revival that's been happening the past couple years, producing and working with artists like MGK, Jaden, and Mod Sun, among many others. And regardless of what you think about those artists, whether you like them or not, it is clear that that is the most important thing to happen in the genre since Blink themselves. So I think you got to give them some credit for that. And so at the end of the day, what it comes down to is this. Even though I personally haven't really liked anything that they've done in the past decade or so, to me, they will always be icon of the genre and just of rock in general. And I have nothing but respect for them, their career and their influence. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And I wanna thank everybody who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my podcasts early, I do giveaways, and there's also a way to have me review your music live on Twitch. If you're interested, all you need to do is join my Patreon at the $10 and up level. Every month I do a call for submissions, drop your band in the comments of that post. Then I will review it live on Twitch and post it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I will sign off for now, but I will see you next time.